Welcome back, I'm Bill. Here's something a little bit different. This is a Sunflame model 3016 made by American Gas Machines, probably in the 1940s. Um, getting information on these is not the easiest thing. It doesn't help that American Gas Machines didn't date their products. Um, American Gas Machines dates back to the mid 1890s. Um, they were for many years a competitor of Coleman, although I suspect Coleman was more of a competitor with AGM. Uh, AGM was their first, they were making the same sorts of gas pressure appliances first. Uh, they made camp stoves, they made lanterns, um, heaters, irons, gas ranges, um, all the same sorts of things that Coleman was making. Uh, they continued uh, up until 1960. Uh, in 1950, American Gas Machines was purchased by Queen Stove, which I believe was in the same town of Albert Lee, Minnesota. Uh, they continued to make their products, however. In 1957, uh, that whole thing was bought up by King Sealy, and again, for a few years, AGM products were still being produced. The last of them were in 1960, uh, and as far as the lanterns and stoves go, they had a line of three lanterns and at least one or two stoves with the same livery, uh, same color combination. Um, AGM's gimmick, you can see at least going back to the early 30s, maybe even into the 20s, was they spelled everything with a K. So you had Camp Light with a K, you had Camp Cook with two Ks, not Camp Cook, Camp Cook. It is a little kooky though, but uh, they, that was sort of their gimmick. In 1960, King Sealy bought out or acquired Thermos, and I think that shook things up enough that all of the AGM products were discontinued at that point. But Sunflame, these are even a little more difficult to nail down. Um, what it seems to go back to was in 1938, AGM went bankrupt. Uh, about a year before that, they had leased warehouse space at least, maybe there was a spot for a production facility there, it's not clear, but they had space they had leased in New Jersey. Uh, when the company went bankrupt, the board of Prentice Waivers was brought in to restructure. Prentice Waivers didn't buy them out, but they, they did assist with restructuring. A new board was put in place or elected uh, and the company carried on. But one of the things that came out of that was they spun off a separate company not sure how independent or subsidiary they were to AGM, um, but it was called Sunflame Appliances and it was based at that facility in New Jersey. Uh, some folks seem to think it was primarily aimed at international distribution of AGM products, uh, but what they were selling there or through there uh, had the Sunflame name on them. Uh, I'm hoping we can clean this label up a little bit better so you can see the logo and all of that. Uh, the logo went through a few revisions, which seemed to help dating earlier and later. Uh, but what this means is that the Sunflame uh, Lanterns production began probably no earlier than 1939. Uh, we know they were made through the 40s. In 1949, Sunflame acquired Akron, uh, which also made lanterns. Uh, and so you see some parts of Akron design uh, migrating over into Sunflame designs. Uh, but these all say uh, made by American gas machines on them. So Sunflame was sort of a subsidiary. Uh, if they were originally intended for international distribution, it may have been World War II that disrupted that and um, resulted in them uh, going into the domestic market. We do know that at least twice American gas machines was fined by the US government for overproducing during World War II and perhaps they were overproducing the Sunflame products as well and those went into the American market. It, it, it's, it's a little hard to say. Um, I kind of suspect that this was made during the war. Um, most of the 3016s you see have a chrome-plated fount and a chrome-plated collar. Uh, AGM used chrome, whereas Coleman used nickel. Um, the chrome doesn't hold up as well. It, it's more susceptible to rust. Uh, so a lot of the founts are problematic. Um, AGM's brass founts are also notorious for stress cracks. So being brass probably saved this. And usually they were making founts out of brass uh, and painting them. This was painted, believe it or not. Actually, in certain lighting you can kind of see, but it was painted the same color as the vent. Um, during the war, they frequently switched to, bra or to a steel founts because brass was being used for munitions manufacture. 
So I suspect this was made uh, during World War II, and that would explain why it's steel. Um, AGM also sold a 3016, which was very similar under their own brand name, not under Sunflame. The difference is that the AGMs, uh, which were also chrome plated, uh, and um, they had a, a plain collar, they didn't have this Art Deco design, and as opposed to the Art Deco design in the vent, they just had holes. Uh, so those vents actually look, uh, they're, they're the same maroon color, but they look identical to a Coleman 2, 242 vent. Um, so I'm guessing early to mid 1940s. Um, this one works uh, pretty well. I acquired it. I, the only thing I've done to it, I gave the vent a wash um, and it had a mantle on it. So I put some gas in, I oiled the pump cup and it fired right up and it ran well, but I'd like to make this thing look a bit nicer. So in this video, we'll be tearing this down. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the AGM valve design, which I've discussed in a video on the 2572s, um, but we can look at that. We'll look at painting, getting things cleaned up. I need to figure out what they originally finished this collar with, uh, so we can try to duplicate that or polish it, whatever we need to do, and then we'll fire it up at the end. So I'm going to get the camera repositioned here so you can see me working on this, and I'll be right back. Let's start taking this apart. So, take the vent nut off. Notice these are larger and they're closed, unlike Coleman's. The upper part of this is built pretty much the same as a 242, although the bale's a little bit different. Similar to a 242 vent, but with this sort of Art Deco design going on there. Now this is not an AGM or Sunflame globe. This is actually a Coleman globe. A um, little bit newer, but not a whole lot newer. And this nut that holds on the, the burner frame is actually the same as the vent nut. So I've got some pliers here with tape on them so I don't mar things up. come off. Now the air tube is swaged in here so that's that's not going to come out. Um, the burner cap is molded into the the manifold. Um, this is and, and this does have a, a screen in there which is kind of unusual for a lot of AGMs. Uh, at least later ones like this guy uh, lost that feature which means they backfire pop a lot. Um, could probably heat this and loosen the the vent nut or the, the vent stud, but I'm not going to bother with that. Now we need to get the generator off before uh, the um, actually before we can get the collar off. And I'm a little bit concerned about the generator. That's not very tight. It's not, oh, there it goes, now it's loose. Uh, I am a little bit concerned about this in that the um, cleaning needle didn't seem to do anything when I had the lantern running. The generator is basically the same as a Coleman. Um, lift the eccentric block up. And I can tell everything in there is really gummed up. The difference with this is uh, this has kind of a claw, whereas and, and it hooks into the, um, the the tip of the or the end of the cleaning needle, um, whereas a Coleman this has a hook and it goes through a little eyelet. So I'm gonna pull this out, and we'll see what's up with that needle. And that would be the problem. We have no cleaning needle. In fact, the tip's even a little bit bent there. I can heat that and straighten it out, um, and we'll see what we can do. You can modify a 220 generator.
clean wire on these if you need to. I'm not sure I've got one, but we can give it a try. So, and I can guarantee the guts on this are not gonna come out without uh, heating and quenching it a bit. So we'll come back to that. Now, this should just lift off the, the valve stem. And I think if we turn it down and lift that off, now the badge, I do want to get the badge off. It's got little tabs, four of them, two on either end. And we should be able to, this is a common AGM design, we should be able to just bend those over. And if we loosen these, usually the other side doesn't need to be messed with. Um, so you can see, or you can't see. Hopefully we'll clean that up a bit. And this, that's steel. It doesn't look, uh, it may have some kind of plating there. It's hard to tell to clean it up, but it's definitely rusty. So to figure out what to do with that. All right, our, well, we've got the fuel cap, this is a small style. It's, I believe, the same size as a Coleman 242. Let's make that tighter so we can get the screw out. Now the whole thing just wants to turn. So we'll make it even tighter. You need to get the gasket locked in there so that it grips. And then we can unscrew this, this screw. There we go. It's a three-piece cap, and it kind of works. The gasket's still okay, um, but I had to really reef on it to get it to seal properly. So my plan is to burn out that old gasket and put a new one in, because I should have the right size. And the pump. Little screw like the older Coleman's. There we go. That wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. That um, the check valve on these, which I'm pretty sure you won't be able to see down there. The check valve on these usually comes out with just a large screwdriver. I'm not gonna mess with it because the check valve's working and um, I don't wanna do any damage to the fountain. Just in case, it probably wouldn't, but just in case. Now, uh, the valve. So hopefully <laughs> this goes all right. I've got a big wrench on here. Unfortunately, this won't really go in a vise because the, the um, tip cleaner lever comes out. Uh, like a Coleman, this, moves the eccentric block for the tip cleaner. Um, you can remove this. I don't know why I'm trying to do that with my fingers. It's not gonna come out with my fingers, but um, it's got the same problem you do with a Coleman. Um, if you try to pull that out, you'll take the bend out of it and it's toast. So um, what I don't wanna do is break the valve off in the bung. Uh, some AGMs have a hex on, on the bung and you need to grab that with a wrench before trying to remove the the valve, if you don't, um, you run the risk of uh, spinning the bung and then it'll need to be uh, soldered or brazed back in place. This, um, this is a steel fount and the bung should be steel and it should be welded in place so I shouldn't have a problem. I'm more concerned about breaking the valve off in the bung, I suppose, although this should be a pretty common AGM valve. And Turn this on its side. Oh, I can feel it. There we go. And it's free. Okay, that was not as bad as I was expecting. And this will hang up as AGM pickup tubes have a screen on the bottom of them, so you just have to pull it out. Oh, and the screen. <laughs> 
That's the first time I've had that happen. The screen is stuck. In fact, there's the clip for it. There's the screen. We won't be putting that back on, but I'm not too worried about it on these. The modern gas is usually pretty good. Um, these were on there to prevent debris from getting up into the um, in, into the valve. Um, and you can see this is this one's pretty gross, pretty nasty. Um, so anyhow. Uh, modern fuel is clean. I'm not too worried about that. Uh, you can see the pickup. It's a little tiny thing down on the bottom there. And these unscrew. And that since they're a bit like the um, the slant, the Coleman slant lanterns, and that it's got that tiny little orifice, you may not even be able to see it, uh, and that's where the fuel was picked up. So that's why they've got that screen on the bottom. Um, it keeps that from clogging up due to crud that's that might be in the fuel. Um, now, this was actually loose. This is just a, a nut to um, adjust the height of the the burner uh, plate. Now oh, this is loose too. That's rather remarkable. That's just the stud that it fits on. Uh, and so when you're working on these, be careful. Don't brace yourself on, on the pickup tuber. You'll end up breaking it off. Take the valve stem and the valve stem nut off. Now these aren't going to come apart, um, or I'm not going to take them apart. Here's your graphite packing. Uh, there's a ring on here uh, that holds it in place. Actually, there are two of them. Uh, and then that screws on. Um, you don't want to mess with this if you don't have to. And the, the graphite packing on this seems to be okay. So we're just going to clean this up. And now, I'll show you how this works when it's cleaned. It'll be easier to show you then, but this is sort of the, this back part on the AGM valve is where you access the, I don't know what AGM called it. If they had a name for it on Coleman, it would be the instant light circuit. So we've got that plug. It's got a little spring that goes into it. And there's a little plunger in here. And that, that controls the, the air um, on startup. So that's everything now except the check valve, which again, I'm going to leave there. You've seen my lantern soup before. Uh, this is citric acid. They use this powder, about a teaspoon per uh, liter of water. Um, boiling it makes it work better and faster. You notice I've gotten brass over here, or at least I've tried to. And this, though it's hard to see, this is the pot, which is mostly steel, although some of these parts are combinations of different metals. Uh, but ideally, you want to try to separate out the brass, brass and the steel so they don't pickle each other. Uh, and um, let this boil away. This will get rid of rust. It will get rid of grease. It will get rid of just about everything else. And then I can hit it in the sink with some steel wool to, to clean it up and polish it on a buffing wheel. Uh, the burner frame we may have to take to the wire wheel. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, it depends how much rust comes off. So I'll see you in a bit. So this is a polishing setup. You've probably seen it in other videos. It's a cotton buffing wheel and I'm using some white number five polishing compound. Um, just put some of that on the wheel.
whatever we do will look miles better than what it started out as. So, you can see there, that's polished. Unpolished. That's the steel. Um, see, this is the generator. That's the brass. Here's our fount. It is steel. The paint is mostly gone. Uh, it's nasty on top, and I can't tell if this is rust. I suspect it's just dirt, but it's just inside the collar. Um, normally, I would use paint stripper on these to prep them for repainting, but uh, thanks to the methylene chloride ban in the US, uh, that's affected the market here, and it's getting difficult to find paint stripper with methylene chloride in it, and as that market shrinks, it gets more expensive. I went all, all over town on the weekend and um, I couldn't find anything that like real paint stripper, that other stuff may work on furniture, on wood and things like that, but it really doesn't work well on metal. Uh, I did find some real paint stripper at one of the auto parts stores, but they wanted something like $80 a liter. So I'm going to use a wire brush. Uh, this is a, a not too rigid, not too aggressive wire brush, it's a cup. Um, that I picked up at Harbor Freight years ago. Um, between that and the low RPMs on the drill press, I found it actually works pretty well without uh, tearing up the steel. I've got a couple other brushes that are in the set as well that can work uh, for other parts of it. I, I found this works really well um, around the, the rim uh, and there's a, a plain round one as well if I need it. Uh, but for the most part, the cupped brush does pretty well. So let's let's turn this on and See what happens. So that does in fact look like rust. Okay, so you can see I'm, I've got my work cut out ahead of me. This is in fact some surface rust and pitting and everything on the top. Thankfully, this is sort of the thick part. Um, I'll show you what this does on the, the side of the fountain where the paint is and then um, I'll get to this. So I think that gives you some idea. I won't force you to watch the whole thing. This will take a while to do the whole fount, um, but I'll see you when I'm done. And presto changeo. Pretty much everything's off. There's a little bit of rust residue here and there. 
um, the top. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, what I'm pleased about is the bottom uh, cleaned up really nicely and it appears all the rest is on the top. And this is the place where I'm probably least worried about it. Um, but I'm, there's, there's a crud in the fount. Some of that may be rust, although when I look with my uh, light here and I can look down through the bung, um, the, the inside actually seems clean. I don't see rust built up on the bottom plate or anything like that. So I'm going to go plunk this in my pot of citric acid uh, when I'm done with the other parts. And um, I think that should take care of things. We'll see where we are after that. Uh, I think we just need some light sanding uh, around the sides. The bottom is good and the top. Um, that may just have to be rough and it'll be hidden inside the collar. Now we're ready to put this Sunflame 3016 back together. I have to apologize first. I had every intention of showing you the painting process for the fount. I showed you how I stripped it with the wire wheel. Uh, I put it in my citric acid pot just to clean any remaining rust off and to make sure there wasn't any rust on the inside. It's actually really nice inside. There's no rust at all. Um, the top is a little bit rough, but I decided not to use any filler or anything like that because it's pretty much all inside the fount. There's just a little bit right along the edge here. Um, so I decided to leave it the way it was and just paint it. Um, I used this uh, trim clad wild raspberry. Um, I'm not a big fan of the trim clad paint. Uh, it turns out looking all right, but it's not the nicest thing to, to spray on. Uh, Duplicolor is really the best in, in my opinion. Um, but uh, it, they sell it at Canadian Tire and Home Depot and their wild raspberry is pretty much a perfect match for AGM's, we'll call it burgundy. Uh, the trim clad gloss green is also a pretty much perfect match for AGM's green lanterns as well. So sometimes you just use what the closest match is, even if it's not the, 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 the greatest paint. Uh, but I still think it looks pretty good. But I have to apologize. I thought I had the camera running when I did the painting. And when I was done with the painting, I went to shut the camera off and hit the, hit the record button to stop it and it started recording and I realized that uh, apparently I didn't hit the button and I didn't make sure the camera was running when I went to do the painting. So uh, I missed that part. So I've got some other uh, lantern videos coming up. I've got an AGM World War II military lantern that needs to be repainted. I've got a 220BX that needs to be repainted. So you can see that in some other videos. Uh, I've also got a, a, a whole video on how to repaint a lantern fount. Um, even though it's a bit of a funky fount, um, but uh, that'll give you the idea if you really need to know that. So we've got our fount. Um, there are no markings on this, no decals, so we don't need to worry about replacing anything like that. Um, the first thing we need to do is get our valve ready to go back in. And I thought I'd give a little bit of an explanation of this AGM valve before we, we put it back in. Um, this is sort of like Coleman's instant lighting uh, valve. Of course, that problem is if you aren't preheating the generator, which mounts up here, as you saw, um, the lantern will flood when you open the valve. You'll get a flare up, you'll get gas everywhere. It's a big mess. So Coleman came up with their instant lighting idea. They put that fuel and air tube on there. So air runs in the top, goes down an outer tube, meets the gas coming in through an orifice at the bottom and runs back up to the valve. And they've got the, the air wire in there that's controlled uh, by the, the valve stem. Uh, when the valve stem is in and just cracked open, uh, it's pushing down the air wire so that you will have a very limited amount of fuel that can enter at the bottom. And then once it's heated up, uh, you can open the valve all the way. And as it moves out, that spring-loaded air wire pops back up and you end up with uh, an open orifice at the bottom. Uh, the advantage with the Coleman system is once the generator is hot and the gas is vapor or the, the, the fuel is vaporized and it, it expands to many times its original volume, that pressure uh, keeps the air from flowing back out or, or from, from entering the top and going back down. You just have gas going in. So you don't lose the pressure on the top of the fount. Um, Akron, I showed in a video how their, theirs works. Um, it is similar to this in that there's an air intake up here, a separate air intake up here at the bottom of the valve that takes in the air that's uh, giving you pressure to push the fuel out. Um, this does much the same thing and it works just as well. Uh, the only problem with these, just like the Akron is, um, once the lantern's running well, you need to shut off this air supply. So the way this works, uh, it's spring-loaded like the Coleman. We 
we've got three pieces here. There's a little metal or, or steel bit that screws onto the back of the valve. It's got a, a spring in it. And this plunger or pip, whatever you want to call it, is brass. It fits in that spring. And so what happens when you screw this in, this interfaces, the tip here, interfaces with the end of the valve stem. So what happens, and, and, and of course the spring is always wanting to push it this way, the valve stem wants to push it back. So when you crack the valve stem open, uh, what ends up happening is uh, the, the spring is still pushing, pushing this in this direction, pushing this uh, plunger in this direction, and it allows the, it, it allows the channel from this orifice here to open, air flows up and into the mixing chamber. Now, what ends up happening is you've got this just all sits, sits in here. Now, what ends up happening is once that lantern is running and the generator is hot, then you unscrew the valve all the way, which it already is. And that allows the spring to push all the, all the way up this way. And it pushes the flange on the plunger it pushes this flange into the back side of the valve and that shuts off the flow of air from, from this little hole here. Uh, so that way you don't lose the air out of the top of the fount or the pressure. Um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I found this valve on every AGM lantern I've worked on um, from the 40s and 50s or early 50s. Uh, by the time you get to the late 50s on the camp lights, they had replaced this design with something pretty much identical to Coleman's instant light with a fuel and air tube and all of that. Um, I'm not sure when they introduced this. I'm guessing at some point in the 1930s. Uh, it's a nice design. It works quite well. You just have to remember once the lantern's burning bright, you need to open the valve all the way because if it's still, if the valve is only cracked and this guy is, is still held back, and this flange isn't seated in the valve, uh, you'll continue to leak air out of the top of the fountain. Eventually you'll lose all the pressure that would push the gas out and the lantern will go out. So that's the valve. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and put that in. And one thing is I've worked on this, on, on, on all these parts. Um, I'm becoming increasingly convinced that this is a wartime lantern because of all of the steel. I think these were normally steel, but um, the, normally this would be brass, it's steel, the, the, the plunger, these, um, these nuts to hold down the, the vent and the, uh, the, the burner assembly, uh, those are steel as well. Lots of steel parts, again, that I would ordinarily expect to be brass. Um, so I strongly suspect that this was made during the war when brass was being used for munitions. So um, this is the, the fuel, or the, the orifice on here. Now, I said earlier I was probably just going to leave this the way it, the way it is. Um, the fount's clean uh, and our modern gas is clean, so I'm not worried about that clogging up. But it just so happens I went digging through my boneyard and I found another little brass screen. So just for... Keep it original. I'm going to go ahead and put that on there. And the fun part is clipping this little guy on there. So I think it works easiest if we just open that up a bit more. I think it's easiest if we put the screen through the clip first. It's even possible. If you watch my 2572 video, I opted just to scrap the whole thing. Okay, I think we did it. Now to pinch that shut. We've 
got that on. Um, and hopefully we can get that through the, the bung without doing any damage to it. Um, to tighten up the... Again, one thing when you're working on these and you're tightening anything on the valve, it's really tempting to, to, to brace on the, the pickup tube or the fuel and air tube on a Coleman and to turn and snap that off. Um, my very first Coleman project I ever worked on, I made that mistake. Now that's too tight. Seem like I backed it off that much, but that feels like it should be good. You can always check that later. Okay, so we've got our valve here. Um, we need to put this stud. This holds the burner frame. And then we had this nut, which just gives support to that. It sits under the burner frame. And these, these should be level. We're almost there. Yep, that looks good. Uh, we've got the, the back part on. Uh, this is ready to go in now. So um, proper clocking is for the valve wheel here in the middle with the fuel cap on the left and the pump on the right. I'm going to use some Permatex blue to seal this. It's not the stuff that uh, locks this in permanently, um, but it will seal the threads. And if I need to adjust the clocking and it doesn't want to tighten up um, as tight as I'd like it, this will seal those and then tighten it up. I'm just going to put a little dab on either side. right where I want it. Now we will put the collar back on. Um, I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping to clean up the badge. Uh, it was sort of gold and black with gold lettering and black background. I think this was maybe silk screened. Uh, it's just metal and I'm guessing it had a gold finish on it at one point in time and then it looks like they silk screened the black background on. So um, the more you clean it, the more it just disappears. So unfortunately we're just kind of going to have to leave that the way it is. So I want to turn this down. We want this part lined up with the valve and that means I'll just rotate and on we go. Um, it's funny, this has to go out through one of these holes. There is actually a, a hole over here. Uh, so I'm assuming for that's, that's for a different valve design. That might be for the two mantle version of this. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, they made a couple lanterns with the same collar design. Uh, the generator. Um, this is one time when I gave up on a generator. I don't usually do that. Uh, but this was so far gone um, that when, you, when I pulled it apart, you saw that the uh, the cleaning needle uh, was gone, just the, the rod that carries the needle was in there. Um, the asbestos tube uh, that, that holds the spring was stuck in there, and by the time I got it out, uh, the spring had been heated and quenched, and one of the few times I've actually had a spring that came apart and, and became fragile and just came apart in little pieces. So I happen to have a spare generator for one of these, so we'll put that in. And again, another giveaway that this was a wartime lantern. Um, the ones I've got from the 40s and 50s all have a brass generator nut on them, and this is steel. 
didn't realize that until I had it in the, the citric acid. Okay, put the generator on. All right, now the burner frame. Again, like the collar, this was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, I did get it cleaned up, but uh, it's pretty rusty. Again, it's steel. A lot of this stuff would normally be nickel-plated brass, um, but even the manifold is, is steel. Um, so we'll slide that guy on. steel nuts. I expect these were probably normally brass, but let's get the collar adjusted a little bit. Let's screw that down. I expect these were normally brass, but they're steel in this case. We'll turn it around. The collar is lined up everywhere, so that's good. Um, now, before we go any further, let's get the fuel cap. Again, I'm kind of tempted Later AGMs, I'm pretty sure these had some thin nickel plating on them, as did the, the burner assembly. It's mostly gone. They polished up all right, um, but there's some rust pitting and all that. I'm, I'm really tempted to, to paint these black. Um, the, so I've got some later AGMs from the uh, late 40s, early 50s that are in the same color scheme, and they painted the fuel cap and the, the pump handle and the, the pump cap black, and they look really sharp. But that really wouldn't be original, so we're not going to do that on this one. Uh, we've got, this is our insert, and we've got a new cap gasket. Burned the old one out with the propane torch. It worked, but you had to really, really, really screw down on the thing. So, put that on, screw the cap on. Make sure that's tight so that it holds, and then at least the consolation, the screw is, is nice. <laughs> A lot of times these screws are all rusty on top. All right, there's our fuel cap, and now we'll put the pump together. So the cap goes on first. Then the spring, then we've got the backer, which also has the, the, I don't know what you want to call it. It's like a screwdriver, but it's for the, for the check valve. Make sure that's nice and tight. Get the pump leather on here, and I'm going to go ahead and some oil on that in a moment, but we'll put the, the washer, that washer keeps it from compressing. It's got a bit of a cup to it. Ah, that's better. Make sure this is tight, because if you don't make these tight, sometimes all the pieces in the pump, pump leather will end up falling off in the bottom of the tube. Let's put some oil on that. I'm a fan of 3-in-1 oil on these. Um, pretty much anything but vegetable oil is fine. Vegetable oil will get gummy. Um, Neat's foot oil is what a lot of people use. Uh, that's what, at least in Coleman's case, that was what they uh, used originally, and that's what they supplied for um, re-oiling. But just don't use vegetable oil because it gets nasty and it gets gummy, and eventually it'll harden on the on the pump leather. We'll line up our screw hole. Thankfully, the paint isn't too thick and isn't causing a problem with that. 
and little tiny screw. This only has one. There is a hole on the bottom, so it's possible someone lost the other screw. Um, these screws are hard to find if you lose them, so don't lose them. I'm not sure that that works. So. Perfect. Now we'll put the globe on. This is a Coleman globe. Similar vintage. And the vent. Let's put the best looking part of the vent out. And presto, there we go. I think she looks pretty good. All right, I'm getting shy on Coleman number 99s, so I'm going to put on one of these Peerless 24As. They're the the, the equivalent. Uh, should be nice on on this. That's a big mantle, but it's not as big as the 111, which is the big monster. And this should shrink up as we burn it in. I think I need to start burning this in at the top. <laughs> Hopefully it'll shrink up a bit. Well, it will shrink up plenty, but. I need to get it to shrink up and lift the bottom off the, off the burner frame there. Now, All right, I think that's good. So I'm gonna put this back together and through the magic of video editing, when I come back, this will be gassed up and we'll be ready to light it. All right, let's put some pressure in this guy. So I just realized, I said that was a hole for a tip cleaner lever, but it's not. This is actually where the match goes in. <laughs> Didn't even think about that. So I'm gonna crack this valve because the fuel system on this is completely dry at this point. So I'm gonna listen for some hissing and sputtering before I put a match in there. All right, that's a good sign. Clear out any vapor so it doesn't go nuts on us. You can see that was that blows a lot of a lot of fuel. It almost looked like it was leaking gas down on the on the burner frame plate, but that was actually just the, the flame going down there out of the burn caps. It's a, it's a big mantle. Oops.
That is one bright lantern. So there we go. A Sunflame 3016, probably made during World War II, if not at some point during the 40s, by American Gas Machines. So hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time.